Good morning, everyone. I'm Dave. Welcome back to the wee hours where I suffer from periodic bouts of insomnia and play games to pass the time. Fighting Fantasy is back on the wee hours channel as Tin Man Games has finally released Fighting Fantasy Classics. So we have several new slash classic Fighting Fantasies to play on the PC. And I thought we would start with one of my favorite, City of Thieves. This is a book that I loved as a kid, 12 years old played City of Thieves, played the heck out of it. Don't remember any of it, so this will be interesting. I have no doubt I'm going to make horrible mistakes. My memory is not flawless by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, the only thing that I remember is that Black Lotus is really important. So if we come across a Black Lotus here, somebody make sure I grab it, because that's the only thing I remember is that's somehow super, super important. We will, of course, be playing this on Adventure Mode, which is how the book was designed to be read. And we have to roll our starting stamina. Come on, please give me a good roll here. Eh, five. I, I could see better than that. And our starting skill... Yes, give me that, please. Okay, that's a little better. Skill of 11, that's not bad at all. And our luck, let's see what we're going to do with that. So, oh, that could have been a lot better. All right, a starting luck of 8. Not, not so good there, not so good. And we need to choose a potion to take with us. So a potion of skill, a potion of strength, or a potion of fortune, pretty self-explanatory, will restore skill, stamina, or luck. I think we just pretty much got to go with stamina because we didn't get such a great stamina roll. And it may surprise you to know there may be some combat in this game. So yes, I will take the potion of strength. Thank you very much. And we must prepare our adventurer's equipment. You begin your adventure with a sword and shield, leather armor, a backpack containing provisions, and a lantern to light your way. Rationing your provisions is key to a successful adventure. They may be consumed at any time, excluding combat by accessing the adventure sheet. Each meal restores four stamina. Be sure to pay close attention to your stamina and restore it regularly. Difficulty setting determines how many provisions you begin with. Adventurers and free readers start with ten. Yay! Yay us! We're one of those people. While well, hardcore heroes begin with three. Yeah, we're not so hardcore here. During your quest, you may encounter characters and items that alter your three scores, stamina, skill, and luck. Usually these scores may only ever be restored to their initial amount. On very rare occasions, a particular page may grant an effect that defies this rule. Some magic items may also allow you to exceed your initial scores. Okay, now we may, our equipment is ready, we may begin. One evening after a long walk through the outlands, you arrive at Silverton, a town which lies at the crossroads of the main trading routes in these parts. Great wooden wagons hauled by teams of oxen are often seen rumbling slowly through the town, laden with herbs, spices, silks, metalware, and exotic foods from far-off lands. Over the years, Silverton has prospered as a result of the rich merchants and traders stopping there en route to distant markets. Its wealth is quite apparent, with ornate buildings and richly dressed people aplenty. But as you enter the town gates, something strikes you as being not quite right. The people look nervous and on edge. Then you notice that all the windows on the buildings have great iron grills bolted over them, and the doors have been strengthened too. Although you usually prefer your own company to that of others, you decide to stay in Silverton for the night. You want to find out who or what is troubling the people. As you walk down the main street, a single note from a bell rings out from a small, from a tall tower ahead. Then a man shouts almost desperately, Nightfall! Nightfall! Everybody indoors! You see people scurrying around with anxious faces and looking surprised when they see you. Across the street, you see a tavern with the words, The Old Toad, painted across its signboard. As you enter the tavern, a whisper runs through the locals as they recognize you. Some put down their mugs and stare. You are somewhat surprised that none come over to hear your tales of adventure. Walking over to the counter, you ask the old innkeeper for a room and a hot tub, but she ignores you and shuffles off over to the great oak door, pushing six large bolts into place. Only then does she turn to you and say quietly, that will be five copper pieces for the room and one more for the tub in advance, if you please. You reach into a leather pouch on your belt and toss the coins on the counter. She hands you an iron key, but at that very moment there is a loud knocking at the door, followed by a voice shouting, Open up! Open up! This is Owen Carliff! The old innkeeper shuffles over to the oak door again and slides open the bolts. Then a fat and balding man dressed in rich scarlet robes bursts into the tavern, looking around frantically. He sees you and walks quickly in your direction, huffing and puffing. He is a man certainly not used to haste. 
You notice great beads of sweat on his forehead in the pale candlelight of the room. As he nears you, he calls out urgently, Stranger, I must speak with you. Please sit down. It is important that I speak with you. When he turns to the innkeeper to snap his fingers for food and drinks, you can see that he is obviously of some standing in the town, but his face is full of anguish and sorrow. Being curious, you decide to hear what the man has to say. He pulls out a chair for you at a table, bidding you to sit down, and the innkeeper bustles in with a tray laden with hot broth, roast goose, and mead. The man in the scarlet robe sits opposite in silence, watching you as you feast, as though examining you for some purpose of his own. Finally, as you push your plate away, the man leans forward and says in a low but anxious voice, Stranger, I know of you, and seek your aid. My name is Owen Carliff, and I am mayor of Silverton. We are in great trouble and danger. We are living under a curse, and it is I who must rid us of it. Ten days ago, two messengers of evil rode into town on huge black stallions, stallions with fierce red eyes. It was impossible to see the faces of the riders, for they wore long black cloaks with hoods pulled over their faces. Their voices were cold, and each word spoken ended with an unnerving hiss. They asked for me by name, and when I came to greet them, they wanted to take my beloved daughter, Muriel, to stay with their master, Zan Barbone. No doubt that you know he is the Night Prince. Of course, I refused their demand, and without another word, they turned and rode slowly out of town, heads down and shoulders hunched. I knew then that beneath the cloaks were hidden the skeletal and soulless bodies of spirit stalkers. Sandbar Bone always uses them as his messengers, as they will complete the mission or die in the attempt, and they do not die easily. Only a silver arrow through the heart will release those evil beings from their eternal twilight existence. Who knows what it would take to kill Zanbar Bone? That same night after the spirit stalkers left, our troubles began. The Night Prince was angry and determined to harm us. Six moon dogs came, each stronger than four men, each with razor sharp fangs. They stalked through the town, entering the homes through open windows and killing the poor people inside. In the morning, we counted 23 dead. So we barred our windows and bolted our doors, yet each night the moon dogs returned and we are unable to sleep for fear they might find a way into our homes. Some people are now talking of sending Muriel to Zanbar Bone. Those whimpering traitors, I should have them flogged. But what good would that do? There's but one hope, and that rests with you, stranger. There is a man called Nicodemus, who, for reasons I'll never understand, lives in Port Blacksand. The place is commonly called the City of Thieves, as it's home to every pirate, brigand, assassin, thief, and evil doer for hundreds of miles around. I think he lives there just to get some peace from the likes of us. He's a wise old wizard, and unlikely to come to much harm, even in Port Black Sand, for his magical powers are great. He alone is capable of defeating Zanbarbone. He used to be a friend of mine many years ago. We need him, and I beg you to bring him to us. None here dares enter Port Black Sand. You will be well rewarded if you help us, stranger. Take these thirty gold pieces for your journey, and take this sword to use and keep. As Owen Carliff rises, he pulls back his scarlet robe, revealing the finest broadsword you have ever seen. He hands it to you, and touching the edge of the blade, you are surprised to see a droplet of blood fall from your finger. You then examine the marvelously ornate gilded serpents twining round the hilt. You have never wanted anything so badly in your life before. You stand up and hold out your right arm to Owen. He shakes it eagerly, saying, You must set off at the first light of dawn. The moon dogs will be gone by then. I shall be forced to stay the night here also, so let's drink to our destiny, and may the gods be with us. For the next hour, Owen talks about your coming journey, explaining in detail how to reach Port Blacksand. Later, you gather up your backpack and furs and climb the wooden stairs to your room. You sleep uneasily, despite the security afforded by your new broadsword, as you are more than once woken by the sniffing, scratching, and howling of the roaming moon dogs outside. By dawn, you are already awake and dressed, determined to reach Port Blacksand quickly to find this man, Nicodemus. As you leave the tavern, a black cat scurries past your feet, and you almost trip. A bad omen, perhaps? The walk to Port Black Sand takes you west some fifty miles across plains and over hills, fortunately without any harmful encounters. Eventually you reach the coast and see the high wall surrounding Port Black Sand and the cluster of buildings projecting into the sea like an ugly black mark. Ships lie anchored in the harbor, and smoke rises gently from the chimneys. It looks peaceful enough, and it is only when the wind changes that you smell the decay in the breeze to remind you of the evil nature of this notorious place. Following the dusty road north along the coast to the city gates, you begin to notice fearful warnings. Skulls on wooden spikes, starving men in iron cages suspended from the city wall, and black flags everywhere. As you approach the main gate, a chill runs down your spine, and you instinctively grip the hilt of your broadsword for reassurance. At the gate, you are confronted by a tall guard wearing a black chainmail coat and an iron helmet. 
He steps forward, barring the way with his pike, saying, Who would enter Port Black Sand uninvited? State the nature of your business or go back the way you came. How will we respond? Tell him we wish to be taken to Nicodemus. Tell him we wish to sell some soul and booty. Or if you wish to attack him quickly, well, that sounds like a terrible idea. Let's not open the door by trying to kill people. But take, being asked to take him to Nicodemus might not be the best move either. This is a pirate town. Let's tell him we're here to sell some stolen booty. You tell the guard that you wish to sell some silver chalices that you stole from a tavern in Silverton, and you will pay him a gold piece for his advice as to where to go for the best price. The guard looks at you suspiciously, saying, Let me have a look at these chalices in your backpack before I admit you. What will we do? Tell him that you know the chalices are cursed and should only be examined by a mage. Or we could try and run past him into the main street or attack him quickly. Let's try a bluff. No, no, those are cursed chalices. At no point in this should you examine them by any stretch of the imagination. Probably should have grabbed some silver chalices in Silverton, but there we are. The guard frowns and says, A likely story, I'm sure, but I suppose you're just the same as the rest inside the city. You may enter at your own peril or buy my advice for three gold pieces. We could ignore the guard and head straight into the city, or let's uh, let's buy his advice for three gold pieces. That's not the worst idea in the world. I'm sure he has some good info. Yeah, we will do that. This city is ruled by Lord Azza, and he's a cruel man. When you preside over the chaotic inhabitants of Port Black, send you have to be mean, and he's the meanest. I should warn you that if you're found without a pass, you're as good as dead. I'll get you one if I were you pretty quickly. Then makes a sweeping gesture of his arm and you walk past him into the city. Through the main gates, you see that the rubbish-filled streets of the port are narrow and cobbled. Old, decrepit buildings line them closely with their upper stories overhanging menacingly. Where shall we go? Shall we go west down Key Street? North along Market Street? Or east down Clock Street? Hmm... Let us start by going west down Key Street. Perhaps we shall find a key that we need. The nice thing about Port Blacksand is all the streets are very clearly marked as to what they do. So we'll go west down Key Street. On the left side of the street, you see a large iron key. No surprise. Hanging over the doorway of a small shop, a sign in the windows reads, J.B. Raggins, locksmith. Yes, we will absolutely enter the shop. Let's do that. Sitting on a stool at the back of his shop is an old bespectacled dwarf. He is busy cutting a key on a cast iron treadle machine, which squeaks and grinds noisily. You cough to get his attention, but he does not look up from his work. Finally, the machine comes to a halt, and the dwarf asks you what you want. I ask him if we have any keys for sale, or see if he knows anything about Nicodemus. Let's see if he knows anything about Nicodemus. I. Dwarves might be slightly nicer than the city guard, so, and I don't know what keys I would want to buy at this point, so that seems a little silly. Let's uh, ask him if he knows where Nicodemus lives. Your question produces a suspicious look on the face of the dwarf, and he raises one eyebrow. Then he says, I know Nicodemus, but what do you want of him? Will we tell him the truth about our mission, or lie and tell the locksmith that you want to kill Nicodemus? Um... I don't think we're going to tell him we want to kill him. He's, he didn't immediately say, oh my goodness, I hate Nicodemus. Uh, he might be a friend of his. Let's tell him the truth about our mission. Let's see where this goes. The dwarf jumps off his stool, his face full of hatred. Oh dear, we've made a tragic error already. He whistles loudly and two huge black dogs immediately appear from under a table with long fangs protruding from their slavering mouths. Raggins points a finger at you, shouting, kill the friend of Nicodemus. Okay, so he did hate Nicodemus. Darn it! I had a 50-50 shot that he'd like the guy or not. Dogs leap at you barking wildly, and we're in a fight, people. Okay, so what have they got coming up? They've got seven skills, seven stamina, and, uh, well, yeah, we've got a reasonable chance at this. So, sure, absolutely, let's fight this. That seems like a pretty decent roll. Yep, that, that'll do just fine. Uh, seven, they got a six there. So far, so good. This is only the first wolf, though. This could still go horribly, horribly wrong. We do not have good luck in combat in fighting fantasy, so... All right, one's down. One's down. Let's face it. Oh, he's got even less stamina, so that's good. That'll go well. And that looks like a solid roll there. Yep, okay. All right, another couple of hits. This guy's going down. That's a great roll. That's a great roll. Yep, you're done. You're done. I think we might get through this unscathed. Yep, we do. Excellent. All right, Dwarf, you and I are going to have some words to say here. Raggins. 
during your fight with the wolf dogs, Raggins runs out of the front of the shop, perhaps to fetch help. Oh, that's not good. That's probably not good. But you know what? While he's gone, may as well search the place. Inside a box on a wooden shelf, you find three gold pieces and an iron key. On examining it, you realize it's a very special key. It's a skeleton key that will open just about any lock you care to try, and we gain one luck point for that. Fantastic. There's probably going to be some people hunting for us, but we've got a good key. The street makes a sudden right turn and heads north. You pass a cluster of small houses and are aware of unseen people watching you walk by. Then the door of one of the houses opens, and a small boy dressed in rags runs out and hands you a piece of paper. Without stopping, he runs off and disappears around the corner. Paper has a message on it, which reads, Arrows from six bows are pointed at you. Leave ten gold pieces in the middle of the street and keep walking. Well, not even sure I actually have ten gold pieces. I just got three. I'm gonna call their bluff. We could obey the instructions, or we could keep walking. I'm gonna call their bluff. I don't believe you have arrows from six bows pointed at me. As you take your first step towards your alarm to hear the familiar whistle of arrows flying through the air. Okay, nothing has worked out in City of Thieves so far. What, so the, the, now the new rule of City of Thieves is whatever I think, do the opposite, apparently. They are coming from windows on either side of the street. Each arrow that hits you will cause you to lose three stamina points, and we've already lost two luck points. How many arrows hit us? Three. Oh dear, that's not so good. Yes, we're still alive. We're still alive. You feel like a pincushion, and although the pain is unbearable, you manage to stagger on down the street. Ahead to your right, you see the door of one of the houses opening, and a little girl looking out apprehensively, she beckons you to enter the house. Okay, my first thought is to actually go in, but this is probably a horrible trap. But I'm going to go in anyway. I'm ignoring my own advice. I'm, I'm going to go in. Somebody's got to be friendly in this town. Somebody has to be friendly. The little girl grabs hold of your arm and leads you back into a room. Saying nothing, she motions you to lie down on a sheepskin rug. Suddenly you're aware of a very old man sitting opposite. He rises slowly from his rocking chair and walks over to you. You watch transfix as he takes a hold of an arrow protruding from your arm and gently pulls it free without causing you any pain. The wound made by the arrow disappears before your eyes. He treats all your wounds in this way. For each arrow wound you suffered, we regain two stamina. Well, fantastic! Then in a slow and almost audible voice, he tells you that he wants the broadsword that Owen Karoliff gave you in payment for the healing. You feel obliged to give, it, give him your sword, but you do it reluctantly. In exchange, he gives you an ordinary fighting sword. Your skill is reduced by one. You know what? That's a fair trade. That's a fair trade. One skill for a whole bunch of stamina. I'll take that. I'll take that. You leave the house and head north. That was the nicest encounter we've had so far. While most of the houses in the street are small, cramped, and dark, you see that one stands alone and is painted bright red. The door has a welcome sign hanging from it. Oh, this can't possibly end well. This the, the, the welcome sign in Port Blacksand? In the City of Thieves? Where everyone's tried to murder me except for one guy who took my good sword? All right, sure, let's enter the red house. Why not? Inside the house, you find yourself in a room painted red and empty, apart from a table on top of which two glass bowls. In one, there is a small golden scorpion. In the other lies a silver scorpion. In the far corner of the room, there are stairs that lead up to another floor. We pick up the gold scorpion, pick up the silver scorpion. We can investigate upstairs or we can leave. I, you know what? I, a gold scorpions, I'm taking one of them. I'm taking one of them. Gold scorpion, silver scorpion. Silver Scorpion. And the reason I say that is my 12-year-old brain knows that there are undead here and that silver is going to come in handy. Not undead in this house, but undead in, you know, City of Thieves game in general. I think silver is going to come in super handy. Inspecting the scorpion, you see that it's a brooch. Brooch? 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 Brooch. You decide to pin it on your leather tunic. The brooch has magical healing properties. After any battle, the brooch will immediately restore one stamina. Uh, you know what? We, we got off light. Let's, let's, let's climb the stairs. Let's not take the golden scorpion. If one's good, chances are the other one's bad. That's just game logic. That's, that's role-playing logic. I would have done that myself as an old D&D &D uh, dungeon master. I absolutely would, would have done that. If one's good, the other's bad. Let's climb the stairs. Stairs lead into a small room. Oh, this guy does not look good. This, this can't end well. This is a dragon living in a house, and I've just taken some of his jewelry. 
although admittedly he just put it in bowls at the front door. The stairs lead into a small room, again painted red. Sitting at a table is a strange creature with a long snout and a deep red scaly skin. From its jaw protrude rows of sharp teeth and a long pink tongue darts quickly in and out between them. The creature looks up at you and stares at you. Are you wearing a scorpion brooch? Funny thing about that. Yes, we are. The creature's outraged that you have stolen one of its brooches. Well, why did you put it in a bowl immediately inside the, the, the front door? You're just inviting people to steal from you. You should get a better security system. It jumps up and you notice smoke curling from its nostrils as its fury mounts. Suddenly a blast of fire shoots from its jaw and it moves towards you with outstretched claws. The blast misses you, but you must do battle. Of course we are. Okay, we're pretty exactly evenly matched here. So this is just going to come down to flat out random numbers here. That's a... Okay. We both miss there. This is just simply attrition at this point. One down on his side. All right. Uh, that looks like a solid roll there. Yep, that's another good one for us. Uh, that one is also looking like a good one. All right. All right, going a little better than I thought here. And that's, no, that's one for him. Yep, that's one for him. That's fine. We're only going to hit him one more time. One more time. That's all we need. There we go. This guy is all done. Can I go take the gold brooch now? I'm, I'm taking everything you've got right now. Oh, we, we do get the copper gold brooch. On top of the lizard iron's table, you find four gold pieces and a scorpion brooch made of brooch, made of copper. Um, I, do we wish to pin it to our tunic? I'm kind of seeing if you start doubling up on brooches, maybe it has a bad effect. Again, I'm just going with basic game logic here. So I am not, I would love to be able to take it, but not pin it onto my tunic. But I don't have that option, so I'm just going to take the golden run. We've got a healing item, and that's a good thing to have. Walking towards you down the street are two town guards. They stop in front of you and demand to see your papers. We do not have a merchant's past. We must have skipped somewhere where we could have got one of those. So we, what would he got? You are unable to explain why you're in Port's Black Sand, and the guards draw their swords, telling you that you are under arrest. Oh my god, it never ends in this. It never ends. Okay, well, you know what? Why don't we fight these guys next time, and we'll pick up City of Thieves in the next episode. Until then, I'm Dave. Thank you, as always, for joining me in the wee hours, and we'll see you next time.